Not too out of focus here. I'm going to be joined very shortly by Zenhammer. Hop on the line here. Hope everyone's having a nice evening. We're going to have a pleasant time tonight working on some electronics projects. Several in mind. There he is. Well, good evening. Hello, how are you? Doing quite well. Let me just turn off this lo-fi hip-hop that is just, oh, I just can't get enough lo-fi hip-hop generally. All right. Welcome, Zen Haver. It's always a pleasure having you on. Good to be here on this fine Sunday evening. Isn't it, though? Had some lovely snowfall today. Yeah, that's pretty much a highlight. I've had nothing but sweets for the last two days. And uh, sweets and coffee. That's been my main sustenance. Yeah, I think I've had enough cookies to, like, fill the volume of my own head. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's that seems about right. It is uh, currently 54 degrees at my desk here. A little cool, a little cool in this uh, here basement studio. Well, tonight, as we do pretty much every Sunday, Sunday night, we're going to be working on some electronics things. Um, going to be I have a couple different projects that I have in mind. Uh, I was up until two in the morning last night watching videos about MOSFETs and transistors, which was fun. Uh, couldn't quite get to sleep until I learned more about MOSFETs. You know the feeling, right? We've all we've all been there before. <laughs> we've all been there. That's right. The uh, the most I've ever learned about MOSFETs though was with some sort of test looming over me in college. So oh, a little no. bit different motivation for learning about them than I think uh, than you had. Yeah, just cramming for a test is a little different, I suppose. Yikes. Um, yeah, so I had a, so I don't even know where to start. Uh, reorganized all my electronic stuff on Saturday. That was my recreation activity for the day was to organize things. I did an okay job. I needed more compartments and things. Um, but uh, I have a couple different projects that are running right now. So we have the uh, greenhouse project is still underway. Haven't really done anything about that other than I got some more parts in the mail which we'll be looking at today we'll look at some of those uh, and then there is a new project that I'm going to uh, I kind of want to spend a little bit of time on tonight uh, a viewer of the stream um, a friend of ours with a, a golden retriever uh, who has in the past had a paw injury uh, I was uh, actually skating with him uh, last week um, he built a, a kind of a contraption a couple of years ago to, to make a treadmill for her that she could, she could do her, her rehabilitation after her paw surgery, uh, at home. So the setup that he had worked, uh, I'll showcase a little bit of, of that here on my screen in a, a few seconds once I find it again. Uh, it worked, but it was limiting in the fact that he had to basically disassemble the whole thing in order to use a treadmill himself. Uh, so he requested that one of the things that maybe I spend a little bit of time on for this stream was to find a way to improve that and, and provide a user interface and to make it a little bit more automated for his dog. So uh, that's one thing we'll maybe work on a little bit there, Zen Hever, is look at that. And uh, also look at, I want to walk through this circuit diagram app that I've been using a little bit and see what you think about its design and if you have any 
kind of warnings or recommendations about it as we go through it, go through that project. Sounds great. Can't wait. Cool. Sorry, that was so long winded. Goodness. Uh, let me pull this up, make sure there's no. Yeah, there's not a lot on here that we don't want to show. So here's this. I love this video. So this is this is Penny. Penny is uh, this is from a couple years ago. Penny is currently doing her rehab right now, and this is the contraption that our friend put together. So he has a hopper that he built out of some plastic parts hooked to a motor. Right now, that motor is just an on-off. There's no speed control on the amount of food that it drops. It's just the one speed. Um, which is kind of where our MOSFET discussion may come in, is, is uh, utilizing PWM for motor control. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty clever setup and worked really well. His, his dog had a full recovery after all that, which is pretty, pretty awesome. So. Um, so the next component that we'll talk about with that is he figured out a workaround for his treadmill buttons. So his treadmill buttons are like a capacitive, I don't know if it's capacitive touch, but it's like a membrane button. So I think typically like a typical button like we have in the keypad example on, uh, in the Arduino kit that I have here, where you basically press it together and then the two contacts press together and, and form that, that bridge. So he basically figured that he could tape wires to that those two ends of that pad. And by using a relay, he could create a closed loop, create a closed circuit and, and basically use the relay as a button press. Um, so this was his way of controlling the treadmill was to actually use a relay to close and be the button press. Um, and it seems like a relay is overkill for this particular type of thing, but this is how he, he was utilizing it. Um, so where we ended up then on the design is, let's see if I actually saved this. There we go. So this is that uh, circuito.io app that I was telling you about a little bit earlier. And it's a really neat app where you can actually, um, I really hope the terms don't say that I can't stream this. Um, but basically you can find components that you want to utilize. And as you click on them, let's say we want a button, any push button switch, we can add it and it creates the breadboard setup and kind of a map for us as to how we would use it. It also ends up putting together some code for us at the end of it so that we can put that into our sketch. And so utilizing this and taking a look at the requirements that our friend had, uh, this is the project that I ended up with. So uh, what, just based on the requirements of what he had, we have a um, a buzzer here, which I thought could notify the dog, which would be kind of neat. Uh, we have the DC motor being driven via PWM on the MOSFET, which this area is kind of sketchy. I'm not quite there yet on understanding this fully. A proximity sensor, or actually a distance sensor for detecting when the dog is actually on the treadmill. A Potentiometer, I thought this could switch from uh, human mode to dog mode. Basically, you could say between this range and this range is human mode, and you have the buttons do different things and maybe turn off the dog feeder. And then this this other range, the other half of the range of the potentiometer could be dog mode, thus activating the dog feeding mechanism and all that kind of stuff. Maybe not having the buttons utilize the treadmill, but having it be run by the proximity sensor. And then a human interface for uh, the various things. So uh, treadmill on, I think treadmill off, and then the speed. 
speed up and speed down, which is what he informed me as the how the treadmill works. Then we have the relays to control the various buttons uh, on the treadmill based on his previous design, which could possibly be replaced by MOSFETs. All of this is running off of a uh, Arduino uh, Pro Micro. I don't know if this is a Pro Micro or not, but this is fairly close to it. It doesn't actually have the USB uh, serial interface on here, but um, it also seemed like there were enough pins to maybe get away with this. So um, that was long-winded. I apologize. Uh, but uh, what, what's, what's your take? What's your initial take on a project like this? It sounds like an, a very interesting project. Um, I agree that the choice of microcontroller seems appropriate. I am curious about the choice of using a potentiometer to control like a bimodal switch as opposed to literally just a, a switch. Sure. Just like a question of parts that you have on hand or, or something I guess I like was, that. I was thinking about like, uh, I initially had a rotary encoder on this spot um, just because I thought about doing like a dial, like a just the interface of turning a dial to be from dog mode to human mode. I guess a toggle switch could also be appropriate, um, but I wanted something that would visually, like not be a momentary switch, but something that you could visually see which mode it is on. Sure, and when I, I say switch, I, I don't mean like a momentary switch. I mean, just like a regular toggle switch, you know, okay. something like with one of the big arms that come out that you, you know, flip from one oh. position to another position. I've got a bunch of those from my truck project. That seems a little more straightforward to me to just select between two different modes, but I wonder if there is a toggle switch in here. Let's just let's have a look see. Not that it has to be in here, but oh yeah. Mini panel mount SPDT toggle switch. That's uh that looks like the exact thing. So, okay, cool. So, and that's just a two wire thing so that might actually help us on our, um, our availability of pins. There's something that I was missing from this particular design that I forgot to add, and that's probably an indicator LED or something that will confirm that it's working visually. Um, maybe saying which mode it is on, but uh, I'm not sure that there are available pins for that. That is a good a good point on the toggle switch. I think that is, is an adjustment that we should make on the design. Uh, any other thoughts or, or what's your take on the the button uh, membrane thing? Does, did that make sense? I don't fully follow it um, because I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. I understand. Yeah, I think I understand kind of the basics about just trying to mim mimic the input from the t the touchpad or the button interface and yeah. recreating it using something that can be controlled via a microcontroller. It's my interpretation of why we're using like relays. So to try to do that. Um, when he explained it to me, he kind of said like the current way that the the buttons work on the uh, on the treadmill is that it's a basically a piece of foil. Here. Oops, move this down a little bit. Then there's a bit of material sandwiched, and then another piece of foil. And then when you press on it, they kind of squeeze together and then uh, create that connection to have that button be pressed. So as you squeeze this, it presses this bit in here. The two contacts connect and and let's just call this like, this is the initial button here. So here's the circuit. So as these, these leads get pressed together, then it creates this circuit here. So this is the initial circuit that was built into the treadmill. And so his idea, and he, he did test it before, and this did take me a few minutes to, to gather as well. His whole thing was he basically just connected additional wires to the foil and then stuck these into a relay so that as you powered the relay, 
it closed the connection and bypassed the membrane pressing. If that makes any more sense. A little bit. The, uh, the whole membranes being smushed together oh. thing, that is still just like basically you could recreate using you you could recreate that using like a momentary switch. So Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, um, that's that's just a, that's like a circuit being closed or a connection being made. So the purpose of the relay is not super clear to me, but it's also probably not super important. So that it is clear uh, if it is known to work. Our, our friend uh, Brashback is actually in chat right now. He says, it's important to note that I'm using the microcontroller to do this so that I can actuate this remotely and walk my dog from work. That makes so, sense. So it could be closed by a button, but he wants this, this action to be able to be closed by the controller. Right? Is that what you meant by you could just close this with a button, or would we be... Is this still over engineering? Uh, no, I think a relay is something that can be very easily controlled via a microcontroller. And if the relay is what's needed in order to correctly get the signal to the um, treadmill in mm -hmm. order to control it, then that sounds appropriate. Uh, if Brashback knows how much current goes through these lines, I, I can't imagine it being a lot. Um, that's something that I think would be interesting to see as well, because that would from what I can understand from looking at MOSFETs yesterday, is that this relay could be replaced by a transistor, possibly, if it is a, a low voltage, just a button being pressed and not any sort of uh, high voltage anything happening. Um, but I was trying to figure out if the advantage of the relay was that it was entirely independent from the, like the relay part that closes is entirely independent from the circuitry of the microcontroller. He says it's probably five volts or less. So yeah, so that's one of the things that we want to we want to design. So um, when we're looking at this kind of thing, um, the thing that kind of concerns me is that as you add certain things, it does build in like as part of as part of this motor build here, um, which is intended to control the motor via PWM. Uh, it also added in without me really telling it to you the specific MOSFET that it needs. Um, uh, this device here, which it's not letting me click on to identify it. Um, I believe that's another transistor. And then this is a uh, diode here, I believe, to control the direction of the flow from the MOSFET. So, uh, so I'm I'm just feeling a little bit in the dark as to how how do I actually use MOSFETs and transistors, and what kind of thing would be a good exercise project for that? Do you have any recommendations? Well. Um, I believe that the inventor's kit probably came, I believe that that came with a simple DC motor, correct? It did, yes. Yeah. And did it come with any discrete MOSFETs or anything like that? Do you have any MOSFETs on hand with which to experiment? I have this whole thing, which has a couple MOSFETs in it, uh, and some additional ones, I believe, yes. Let's have a look-see. So we could just try and... Think of some small project or piece of code to write to try to drive a motor using a MOSFET and see yeah. if it would suit our needs. That sounds excellent. I assume that the appeal of the MOSFET here is that you're able to use a microcontroller to digitally switch it on and off and allow a greater amount of current to flow through the MOSFET than what the Arduino can provide itself. MOSFETs yes. work really great yep. as digitally controlled switches that allow for a greater amount of current to flow through them than the current required to turn them on or off. Yes. Yeah, that is um, that is the case because the 
uh, DC motor would have more current being drawn to run than the uh, signal can use, or I should say, than the Arduino can supply. So I have three MOSFETs. Um, and this is from the uh, Radio Shack Learning Lab kit. And so let me just get under here. This is where they have some of the uh, integrated circuits. So we have, I love that MOSFETs are so easily easy to identify with these big uh, tabs on the top. You do see that those are transistors. So um, yeah, so I have a, I have three different ones. There are three ones that are, so I have two E29s, or, whatever, or six, sorry, 630B MOSFETs. I guess I'll, I should look those up, see what those do. And then there's another one that I believe is a, is old. 785CT. I don't have any information on those as, apart from the names of them. So maybe we should have, give those a look those up quick and see what they do. Right, we'd be looking for a spec sheet. Something like that, yep. Something that tells us whether they're N-channel or P-channel. Right, N-channel and P-channel. Um, I learned about that last night, but it was a foggy haze as to what that actually meant. Shoot, don't you hate that? When you like, um, I know those words, but then you have no connection to what they mean. Yes, you recognize you recognize the word, but not don't recognize the meaning. So let's look up here. So when we're looking at this, which numbers should I look up? What's what's actually important here? Not entirely sure. Should I be looking at the E29? Is that like a manufacturer or the 60B? Yeah, that's, hmm. <laughs> Looks like the 630B is an N-channel MOSFET. OK. Six. So how would, how would I decide which kind of MOSFET, MOSFET to use? It's kind of about like how much current goes through it, right? Um, the N-channel versus P-channel, from my understanding, is the logic level required to drive it. An N-channel MOSFET will allow current to, th to flow through it, essentially, when the logic level is high, or like, you know, you, basically when you apply voltage to the gate. Yep. But a P-channel MOSFET um, is the opposite and will sort of quote unquote activate when the logic level applied to it is low. Oh, interesting. So you're not like telling it which one to look for. It just, so this is this kind of um, similar to what we were talking about when we were first going over these like integrated circuits as they're kind of pre-programmed to do certain things. Uh, a MOSFET is definitely not, hmm, how to, how to put it. A MOSFET is a very basic, piece of electronics it's its operation is entirely like determined by physics of how it's constructed okay basically those integrated circuits that we look at before like any one of like the 555 timer or anything like that is itself composed of a large number of transistors that dictate okay. how it operates this is sort of the building block of all more complicated integrated circuits. Interesting. I don't know if How that explanation be... helps at all, but it it does. How can they be so small? <laughs> because I know that's... Uh, you need very very few electrons to accomplish <laughs> accomplish the task of just allowing current to flow or not flow based on an applied voltage. This is the other MOSFET that I have. 
So 7805CT. Let's see. Um, ooh, we have a nice diagram for this one. That's cool. Let me get some pin out on it. Or a um, diagram of it. That's good. Uh, it's not saying whether this is N channel or P channel, though. I'll have to look back. So, how would you decide to use an N channel versus a P channel? Like, is it kind of like a normally open or normally closed type thing, like you'd see on a on a relay? Like, just deciding how how to get power to it. My understanding is that there are situations where one or the other is required, but for something like this, where you are sort of deciding what you want to be active versus not active, like them sure. being driven from a mic controller, I don't believe that it matters because you can just modify, <laughs> you could just modify the software to drive in the opposite direction to accommodate the other right. kind of transistor. Okay. I'm sure that there are nuances and asterisks buried in there that I don't recall or know, but uh, at a high level, I think, it doesn't matter for this application. That'd be interesting. Like, um, it seems like this could be useful for, like, if power is cut from something or something like runs out of battery, you could have the MOSFET turn on or something, right? If it's getting low power. Hmm. Potentially. But, and does low power equate no power in these situations? Like, if it has no, no power going to the, um, input pin would that count as a low or would that count as a nothing i believe that that would count as a nothing or like no no it would count as a low sorry it would count oh. as um as if yeah as if though there was no power being applied interesting so as far as the button press things go, would you feel like the relay is cleaner than the using a MOSFET for that? For the, the foil uh, button closure type thing? I feel like a MOSFET would be preferred. Relays are kind of bulky and yeah. take space. MOSFETs are small and at least a little bit easier for me to understand. Yeah. They're cheaper too, right? Like relays are at least a buck a piece. Seems like um, and MOSFETs come in quite a bit under that, right? I think I should, I saw yeah. some last night for like twenty for ten bucks or something, twenty for six bucks um, of unknown quality. But okay, cool. So looking at designing this then. Maybe building it out with, um, yeah. Let's let's do our MOSFET experiment first. So, let's um, maybe just see if we go to this this thing. Let's remove everything from here, and let's just grab our. I think it just adds the MOSFET when you put in the motor here. Yeah. So this is the design that it gives. So this is one of the things that I was uh, I was watching. This really great channel. I don't know if you've had a chance to view it, um, but let's see what is it called. It is called. I've been just trying to devour his videos lately because they're so good. Uh, Drone Bot Workshop. This guy here. Hey, Grant. I'm also Grant as well. Welcome. Welcome, Launchpad SPG. 
SDG. Um, if you haven't had the chance to check this dude out, he is excellent. He has some really cool stuff. And what he was talking about with the MOSFETs and the motors is that there's a little bit of, as they turn off, there's a little bit of current that spikes back uh, to the controller that can burn it out. So he had to add a, a diode to the design here. So this, this one here, this diode rectifier. And so that was another thing I couldn't quite understand is how, well, like, when do you need to use diodes and how do you make those kinds of decisions? Man, when it comes to motors, I am not the person to talk to because I have very <laughs> little experience actually designing circuits to drive motors. Sure. And that is just a whole area of electrical engineering that you could probably spend your whole life <laughs> whole learning, life about learning about and mastering that I just have not. Maybe we make the MOSFET turn on an LED instead or something. That, seems that like would a be good... a very simple project that we could knock out pretty quickly. Right. Um, I'm going to probably tear apart my uh, previous design, previous thing I was working on up until quite recently. Oh, camera, focus, buddy. Dang it, anyhow, I changed the settings on it too and it didn't work. Shucks. Well, here's, here it is. Um, this is the uh, last thing we we're working on. So this is part of the part of my greenhouse project. Um, so option one is I tear this apart. Or option two is we get the other Arduino Uno up and running that I have in this case here. What do you think, Zenhaver? Should we, should we leave this be as it's kind of an ongoing project? Try and get the other one going? Hmm, how much of the of that circuit are you would you potentially reuse for a greenhouse project? I think quite a bit of it actually, because instead of the LEDs, uh I would be using this to control various relays. So but I can always just take a picture of it. I mean I have this saved, so um I think I might just tear it apart because I don't really want to deal with like uh configuration right now, right? Getting another Arduino to work with a computer. Yeah, sounds reasonable to me. All right. So we're going to do that. I'm going to take this apart. Prototype a PCB for it. I should. I have all kinds of PCB prototyping gear now to play with. I did some soldering last week. Um, oh, a Zen Haver. I got some soldering done. I, I hope you'd be proud, electronics dad. Um, got some pretty good stuff, so I think it did an alright job. So this is from from last week. I got my keypad thing started, my keypad project. Soldered in my my buttons and then the uh, I can't remember what it's called, like the headers or the inputs for this Arduino Pro Micro. Got them all soldered in. And uh, they're not, it's, you know, it's not the best soldering, but it's, it, it's yeah, it's not the best soldering, but it's there. It seems the solidly best attached. soldering is functional soldering. Yeah. If nothing is going wrong with it, then the soldering was good enough. Exactly. All right, so let's take this thing apart. Do actually use some of these LEDs here. Temperature sensor. So how are the adventures of your 3D printer going? They're going quite well. I ended up 3D printing some Christmas gifts for various oh. members of my family. Excellent. Perfect timing. Uh, yes, got some like uh, herb planters printed that I was able oh. to gift to uh, someone, and they turned out very well. Perfect. Otherwise, three D printer has been a little quiet recently, as I've been focusing on some other things like playing video games. An excellent thing to focus on. 
Good, good. Um, any any future projects, any future 3D printing projects that you're going to be looking forward to here? Yeah, an excellent question. Um, giving some 3D printed gifts to my family caused them to be very interested in the 3D printer generally and oh. asking about it a lot. So I may try to print some more little doodads nice. for my family. That's excellent. Got some ideas for like printing some shelving brackets, some light duty shelving brackets. Ooh. Um, for using, for making like cat shelving. Excellent. Uh, cat shelving, as in for the cat to be on? Or... Shells for the cat to be on and use. Gotcha. For the cat's books. <laughs> for the cat books. Other than that, nothing really on the horizon. Does your cat qualify as light duty? I don't know if it does. She is not very light, yes. <laughs> but in the grand scheme of shelving, I would consider her light duty. Gotcha. So I just did the old, hopefully this works. I um, I just sent in, sent over a new project, just completely blank to this before we tried our MOSFET thing. Um, so that this, when we first powered on, it doesn't try and send random power to random pins because I was using most of the pins for stuff. So I wanted to start from a blank slate. Yeah, that seems like a pretty sound, a sound choice. So where do we start? Where do we start here? Uh, I always like to start with the circuit itself. Okay. Uh, I do want to note that I'm a little bit behind or I don't have a good feed for the live stream on our Google Meet. Oh, don't. That is something that we can fix. I think. Is and it I can frozen watch. or? It's, it's frozen slash only updating once every 20 seconds. Gotcha. I wonder if I'm losing frames or something. Yeah, it's struggling. I can. I have been watching the your Twitch stream, but it's about fifteen seconds behind. Okay. Our conversation. I I will try to take that into account. Thank you for letting me know. So the circuit. So here's the star of the show. This is our MOSFET here. So what else shall we use? Let's use an LED. We'll be powering on and off. We'll use this blue one. And along with the LED, we have a 330 ohm resistor. And what else shall we use? Probably just some jumper wires, right? Yep, I think that sounds about right. Okay, so got a couple of these here. And so First thing we should try and figure out is what are the pin assignments on this particular MOSFET? Yes, and according to the data sheet, they, they should be labeled gate, drain, and source. Those are the three pins on a on a MOSFET. Yep. We just need to figure out which pins are which. They are not what labeled. The, what is the what was the uh part number again? 630B. Type in. So I saw. What you mean, Launchpad? So you saw a sonic sensor and a motor. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's it. Uh, we were just talking about it a little bit earlier. So we're working on this project for a friend of mine. Uh, let me pull this back up here. Uh, we're making a dog walking uh, controller. So my friend has in the past had this up and running 
for his dog. And so we'd be controlling this motor with uh, PWM, MOSFET. And then the sonic sensor, or the yeah, sonic sensor would be to tell that the dog is there. We'll go back into the overall circuit diagram in just a little bit. Once we figure out the MOSFET thing, which is kind of a bit shaky for me as a concept in general right now. All right, Zen Haver, what, is, what does the data sheet say? It would appear that as you're facing, as you're holding the MOSFET facing it, the leftmost pin, which is pin one, is the gate. The middle pin, which is pin two, is the drain. And the rightmost pin, which is pin three, is the source. Gotcha. So the one on the left here, I, ha I wish I had it, one of those tiny finger pointers. This thing, that is the gate. Right. I'm this is where it. that that is where that fifteen second delay <laughs> is coming in. <laughs> you like how quickly I forgot about that. <laughs> um, hey, Chef Rex is rating. Cool. Thanks, Chef Rex. Welcome, welcome. How's it going, everybody? My friend Chef Rex is working on an RC rock crawler right now, which is a very complicated build um, with some cool transmission pieces and things. Uh, and uh, he just raided with some friends. And so uh, for anyone who's just joining, we're working on making just a test circuit for a MOSFET transistor so that I can better understand how to use this in the future. So the, hey man, that's all right. Uh, so sorry again about the delay, um, Zen Haver. So this one here on the leftmost size is the gate. So that's where we apply the logic, right? That is correct. And then the other two, um, Let's see. Well, let's start there. Let's start there. So I'll put this up on kind of in this starting at the 10 area here on the breadboard. I don't want to go in very well. There we go. OK, so that is plugged in there. So. Let's hook that up, and that's a digital pin, right? That we're going to want to connect that to? One digital yes. outputs? Yep. Yes. Should we choose the PWM enabled one, probably? I would choose one that's PWM enabled, yeah. So I'm going to go with um, digital pin three. Connect that there. So, and then we have our LED, which the long leg of the uh, LED is the positive, right? On these, I believe. Man, I'm a bad electronics engineer because literally every time I have to look it up, you'd think I'd have memorized <laughs> by now. I'm sorry. The longer the leg. leg is the positive or anode. The shorter leg is the negative or cathode. How often do you use the terms anode and cathode professionally? Mm, almost never. Usually not in my, just call not them in my positive particular. and negative? Or? Yeah, high side, low side, or yeah, positive, negative. Gotcha. I don't, we don't use really LEDs in my particular line of work, so. Sure. It's so confusing because the RGB LEDs, the long leg is the negative, but um, where is the cathode? So. All right, so I'm going to set this up then. So the positive is going to be closer to the MOSFET. And so as we hook this up, how exactly are we can so where do we pull power from and how where do we send it to the So the way that I would hook this up <clears throat> is that I would have the MOSFET basically be a switch between the LED and ground. Okay. Um, 
and so to do that you would hook up like you take you take your five volts your your high logic put it through the led and through the resistor and then hook yeah. it up through the mosfet as the switch between the load and ground does that kind of configuration make sense it does let me get that in place get a more accurately bent hey v eager welcome more accurately bent resistor here around i flipped around my led so that i was uh connecting the anode through the route that goes through this resistor It doesn't matter which of the MOSFET pins I attach the negative of the LED to. I believe it does, and I believe that you would want to connect it to the source. Sorry? Source. I would connect it to the drain. The drain, which is the center pin. Yes. And then I would connect the source to ground. Because the, the MOSFETs, don't they have like a built-in... Uh, diode or something like they do they have sort of an intrinsic diode just by nature of the physics of how they're constructed oh, i need a longer wire and so i think oh. if you were to hook them up <laughs> in the opposite direction as in hooking up the the path from positive or from yeah from five volts through the source and then the drain to ground i believe that it would just always be on due to that sort of intrinsic diode operation and that's again kind of as you said it's it's not like it's programmed or anything this is just the physical nature of the device that's correct okay so here we have that looks a little bit cleaner here. Um, I'll use a different color actually, so we can see that more. Okay, so following the positive here, we're going from five volts to row four which then goes to the 330 ohm resistor, which then connects to the anode of the LED. The cathode of the LED goes to the center pin of the MOSFET, which is the drain. And then the other word, which is the other side of the, of the MOSFET, goes to the ground. Yes, the source. The source, thank you. Um, then the controller pin, which is another word. Um, what is that called again? A gate. Gate, thank you. The gate is then connected to pin 3 on the Arduino, which is a PWM-enabled pin. Does that sound about right? I think that sounds right to me. Right. Plug it in. Let's do it. Well, let's think about what <laughs> what software we need to write to. Yeah. Um, do we need a button? Maybe some kind of input to control this? Um, we could just do a timer and just say like every. I, I, let's do a timer. Yeah. Every loop, do this for how many seconds? Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking maybe if we wanted to, we could probably just like, I don't know. Let's just use the uh, sketch for the blinking LED in the first place. Yeah, I think that sounds just good. Tear that apart a little bit. Yeah, because we're basically just substituting directly driving the LED from the Arduino with driving it through 
a MOSFET. Yes. Which is just an extra step. But that's fine. Yes, okay. I like that idea. Um, we have a, a very wonderful thought from Chef Rex. The ground is the source of all things. We all come from the ground and ultimately end up in the ground. Happy life thoughts with Rex. I tried to give my best G-Man voice. There actually it was about a 30% effort G-Man voice. And I already had this one open actually. So. Okay, so here's our sketch. So this is our blink. So right now it says pin mode 13 is the output. Let's change this to pin three. Three is the output. Digital right, 13 high. Delay 100, wait for two seconds. Digital right, digital right. Three low. I guess I could have just plugged this into 13 instead of 3, but. Is this our goofy Morse code that we wrote? I bet it is. I think we said something lewd, but I can't remember what it was. Don't you hit, you like, you get far enough where you think, I should have just done a find and replace, but I'm already 60% done, so I might as well just keep going. My time savings will be lost if I switch now. Sunk cost fallacy. Don't don't succumb. Don't succumb? Just because you've already spent that much time doing it <laughs> manually. If it would still be faster for you to do a find replace, you should do and that cleaner. find replace, ignoring the amount of cost that you've already sunk into doing it the manual way. And I would I could have missed a thirteen. I'm just gonna do this. There we go. Good. Okay. So we're gonna write high to pin three, and that should high and low to pin three, and that should be good. I'm gonna upload. Let's see if this thing does a thing. Hey, it does a thing, and it doesn't even smell like burning yet. Cool. So, what a resounding success! What have what have we learned here? We've learned basically the essential to all modern computers and electronics, wow. and that is how a MOSFET works as a digital switch. Interesting. I kind of want to. I I know this is kind of dorky, but I'm gonna take a picture of this because I don't want to forget this circuit. It's important. Not as a like milestone of like, look, I've made a computer. It's uh this is a big step and, and I'm gonna forget a lot of it. So thankfully MOSFETs are probably one of the most well documented inventions <laughs> in modern history. Oh. You know, they are the, the base the basis upon which modern society is built, essentially, and I'm not even like exaggerating at all. Um and so a simple using a, a MOSFET as a switch sort of application, you will you would be able to find a lot of examples pretty easily. Question from Launchpad SDG. Here's a question. Why use a MOSFET rather than a transistor? And I'm going to take a stab at it, and then Zenhaver, if you want to follow in, is that a MOSFET is a transistor, but it's one that is more easily controlled with digital logic like current from like a an Arduino or something? You are mostly correct. A, a MOSFET is a transistor. Metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor is what MOSFET stands for. Um, I think the advantages of a MOSFET is that they're able to switch higher amounts of current and okay. also require less current at the gate than like uh, BJT transistors. Oh. Um, I 
don't remember all of the nuances about when you would select a certain type of transistor versus another one. I, I think we chose MOSFETs because it's what we happen to have on hand. Yeah. Could a regular transistor be used as a... Because I think I have some, some smaller ones. Um, you could very easily use a regular transistor in this particular learning application. As like a, a digital switch like this, this would work just fine. So this is another transistor that I have here. How many pins does it have? Three pins. So even for our like foil button switch thing, that could possibly use a trans like one of these types of transistors. If my understanding of the requirements of the interface for the treadmill are correct, and that you only need to either send like voltage low or voltage high as a signal for the yeah. button has been pressed or not pressed, mm -hmm. a regular transistor like this would work. Seems like it would work just fine. Cool. And I imagine these are even cheaper. I think so. 99% of the cost with a discrete transistor like this is in the metal running down the legs and the housing. The actual like transistor part itself is would be a negligible part of the cost. The launchpad says, ah, I'm trying to understand the BJTs better. I went to school for electronics, but but as much as we did on it, all I didn't get much understanding out of it. I don't even know what a BJT is, man. Bipolar man, man. junction transistor. Yeah. What is what's what's that all about? A BJT is Hmm. Just another type of transistor. I actually probably couldn't tell you a lot more about them because f f me as well, <laughs> Launchpad, I, it's been 10 years since I went to school for electronics. So a lot of the nuances for transistors has kind of leaked out as I've moved a lot more into the software side of things. And into Rocket League? And into Rocket League, yes. <laughs> Rocket League takes a lot, probably 90% 90, 90 of my brain power on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen the highlight reel. It's impressive. Um, cool. That helps a lot, though. Thank you for, for walking me through this project. Um, is there something that would help explain... Um, explain just regular diodes better and, and using diodes and what situations to need to that require them? Well, at a high level, diodes are used to control when current is allowed to flow in one direction versus another direction. Sure. So in the case of like that we were talking about before, a motor where as soon as you switch power off to a motor, there's significant blowback current hooking up a diode across the leads of the motor would protect whatever source is driving that motor from that blowback current. Sure. Are they used, are, do you end up, um, are they used elsewhere quite often or in other scenarios or is it mostly? Diodes are used all over the dang place. Yeah. They're very, they're, they're a pretty important piece of electronic circuit design. All I can think about is like one way gates for my oxygen not included dudes. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I can only go this way. Yep. Please don't walk this direction. You need to wash your hands, dang it. <laughs> yes. Um that's kind of what it is, right? It's just like a one directional kind of thing. Yes, very much so. How does that even work? How do you do that with electricity? That's weird. Is this I magic, don't know magic off the top of my head. It's definitely not magic. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. So, cool. So we've already done an ultrasonic distance, um, like distance te test. That's another component for what we're building. Um, so let's take a look at the rest of our circuit and see what else we might want to work on. I mean. Relays. Oh, right. We're going to talk about relays. I forgot already. So, one of the 
toys that I got recently. That's fairly current production. Yeah, it's getting there. Let's see if this, that's not going to be, that's too much. I need to 3D print a stand that make, allows my microscope to be zoomed out further. So I got one of these relay modules. So these are the cheapest ones I could possibly find. Probably not the best quality assurance, but um, this is going to be a component not only in uh, possibly in this dog walking mechanism, but definitely in my greenhouse project. Do a motor speed control with the MOSFET and a PWM. Uh, Brashback, I don't have that locked and loaded today. We could try to do it based on this thing. We could. I think basically what we would do if we wanted to try that out, it would be to replace the uh, the LED in our circuit with a motor. I do have a diode in here. I have four and silicone diodes. We might we might not even need the diode, honestly, because I believe really? the MOSFET is providing protection to like the Arduino, if that's what we're concerned about. Because the MOSFET, no. the gain is pretty much electrically isolated from the drain and the source, if my recollection is correct. Will you, let me take a look. I want to take a look at the circuit diagram sure. and try to understand what the diode is actually doing here. Um, would you like me to send it to you? I have it. You, could, you can make it yourself as well in the yes. thing. I just screen captured your stream <laughs> to Nice. I think this is the this is a diode. Yes. What is this? I can't even see that well. What is this thing? I think it's a diode looking at the this is so incredibly small oh, my fingernails dirty sorry gang that looks like it's marked as a diode so we do have one we have a couple of them these are so small how could a thing even be this small That's a Zenir diode. What can you tell me about Zenir diodes, their launch pad? There's so little. I wonder what this is even asking us for. It's saying a diode rectifier one amp, 50 volts. Wait until you get to SMD. What does SMD mean? Uh, surface mount, I believe. A surface mount diode? Yeah, surface mount diode. Oh, for how teensy tiny it is? Oh, yeah. man. I tried to look at some of that stuff, and I, my eyes go out of focus. So I don't know if I have the diode to spec as to what um, this thing is asking for. I have four of them, but they're teensy tiny. I don't know if they're rated at the same level. I'm gonna try and see. <laughs> Small, medium, to large. I'm copying, copying from Google to say it better, but as an as a near diode is a special type of diode designed to reliably allow current to flow backwards when a certain set of reverse voltage known as a Zenier voltage is reached. Zenier diodes are manufactured with a great variety of Zenier voltages, and some are even variable. 
That's wild. Makes me think that I want other kinds of diodes. Dang it. Yeah, I don't think I have much for diodes here, gang. So what is uh what's the verdict on whether or not it's needed, Zen Hever? Hmm. Good question that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of uh part of me wants to say what's the worst that could happen? I could fry my Arduino. Hmm. I suppose that that is the worst that could happen, but I also think there's a very low chance of that happening, but not a 0% chance, so maybe not worth pursuing. Yeah, I just, I could even say, like, let's do that next week when I get one in the mail or something, you know? So Sounds I'm reasonable. sorry, I'm sorry, Brashback, we'll have to wait until the shipment of diodes is upon us. Um, but I think in the meantime, um, there's a couple other experiments we could work on. So we have this whole kit to play with, and there are some other things in here that I think would be beneficial to go through for both of these projects. Um, so we have all kinds of fun stuff to play with here. Um, so I have a relay module, but I don't really understand relays. I guess I do understand relays all right. Like I know what they're supposed to do and generally how they work, but I've never actually built one. There is a relay module in here that we can kind of build our own instead of uh, where it's just this blue bit and we can create the rest of it, which might help me understand the system better. Um, so that's one thing that we could work on. Um, there is a, a few other fun things in here we could play with. Um, oh yeah, it's right here. So this is the uh, bit that we could play with here. This is the other um, relay. So it couldn't hurt to have it, but like your friend said, the MOSFET should act as a diode as well because it would shut off between the transitions. You use that kit to make sumo bot. Cool. What sumo bot? If you have a uh, write up or a video or anything like that, um, feel free to throw it in chat. Love to see it. So we play with our relay module here, um, or we could say the hell with it and, and try with our our other kit. Um, we could also work on. I'm just like reading through here what else I could play with. Um, oh, I thought about trying out this membrane switch project. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know Sumo Bot. Um, is that a joke? I don't understand. I'm very new to this, man. Oh, okay, so we gotta we'll watch we'll watch that later. Thank you. I will I will digest that link after the stream. Um, this keypad project could help me better understand this keypad project. Um, a lot of the software and the design of this is based on this example, so it could be another fun thing to play with. Um, I also thought this might even be. Uh, interesting just for our treadmill project because this is probably a similar type of switch that the treadmill is using. So, um, what seems interesting to use on Haver? I think I am down for anything. The keypad looks interesting to me for sure. I'm trying What's to figure that? out how to decode that. Yeah, there. Uh, the main thing that I'm trying to figure out on this is uh, whether or not, like, why I'd need to solder this diode bypass. So part of the, the circuit diagram has a 
where you can solder in diodes for this, which I think are for when you have multiple keys being pressed at once, but I don't understand why I would need that or not need that or any of that kind of thing. So, um, so that's something I'm a little curious about. But uh, I also, he does provide some software for it or a sketch for it to be used. Uh, but it might be really good to understand some of the basics on it prior to trying to use this kind of specialized example of one. I do have some uh, board mountable LEDs that I'm putting on right here, I believe. I think that's where they go. Well, cool. Let's, uh, let's pull up that sketch in that project in the project kit for this thing, and we'll just kind of switch gears to that. That sound good? Sounds great. I have so many spare... They're not cherry keys, but they're knockoff cherry keys. Um, so any of these keypad, keypad projects are kind of interesting. I'm actually thinking for this project of using some uh, cherry type switches here instead of in this part, instead of these uh, momentary switches like this, actually just utilizing some of the cherry type ones. Could be neat. Maybe some custom keycaps for the treadmill, 3D printed. Could be fun. Sounds right? very exciting. Yeah, I think so too. It sounds very exciting to me, but I recognize I'm a very boring person. So um, it's so hard to know whether or not something like that is actually exciting, right? So tough to tell. All right, so I'm going to go to this camera while I try and find the PDF with the guidebook that came with this kit. Nice. It opened up in Microsoft Edge, but I'm just going to roll with it. I'm going to pretend that this is just a normal place to look at PDFs. So, membrane switch module. Alright. Membrane switch module, page 85. All right, so lesson 11, membrane switch module. In this project, we will go over how to integrate a keyboard with the Uno R3 board so that the Uno R3 can read keys being pressed by a user. Keypads are used in all types of devices, including cell phones, fax machines, microwaves, ovens, door locks, etc. They're practically everywhere. Tons of electronics devices use them for input. So knowing how to connect a keypad to a microcontroller such as the Uno R3 board is very valuable for building many different types of commercial products. At the end, when it is all connected properly and programmed, when a key is pressed, it shows up at the serial monitor on your computer. Whenever you press a key, it shows up on the serial monitor. For simplicity purposes, we start at simply showing a key pressed on the computer. For this project, the type of keypad we'll use is a matrix keypad. This keypad that follows an encoding scheme that allows it to have much less input pins than there are keys. For example, the matrix keypad we are using has 16 keys, 0 through 9, A to D, and asterisk and pound, yet only 8 output pins. With a linear keypad, there would have to be 17 output pins, one for each key and a ground pin, in order to work. The matrix encoding scheme allows for less input pins and thus much less connections that have have to make for the keypad to work. In this way, they are more efficient than linear keypads, being that they have less wiring. Good. That's the drawing. What does this even mean? Goodness gracious. Do you have any insight on how uh, matrix keypads work there, Zenhaver? Yes. I have to wait a few seconds in order to see the drawing that you're referencing. All right. That is right. They are take... essentially how a membrane keyboard works. I know mm -hmm. that. 
a membrane keyboard, the inferior type of keyboard. Yes, yes. Ugh. I mean, I feel that way, but it still like hurts to say that out loud. Um, uh, okay, so the drawing there is is re basically representing in circuit diagram form that how the keypad operates. Okay. So each one of those little black switch, um, black switches represents one of the keys on the keyboard. Okay. And it's basically showing how like, uh, how to explain it. You see like the gray wire going left to right on the top is hooked yeah. up to four different switches, but each of those switches that the gray wire hooks up to has a different vertical wire that it's connected to. And so yeah. each key has a unique combination of uh, of horizontal and vertical wire that becomes actuated when oh. the key is pressed. And so you basically, and that's how it how, that's how it accomplishes the sixteen different buttons, but only eight uh, lines going to it is basically you have to look at every one of the eight lines and look at which two are turned on, and that's how you know. Sure. Which button is pressed? Does that gotcha. make sense? Yep. So it's kind of it's like battleship, kind of. Uh, two, two coordinates, sure. one in the X and one in the Y. Yep. And you can get. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do we wire it up? Oh, that's not too bad. So let's let's get that rolling. I'm going to unhook our MOSFET experiment. That is really in there, huh? Not putting things away completely properly, but I will do that afterwards. And I'm 100% going to remove this MOSFET with my Nipex, because good gravy. Good old Nipex. Knipex. Can you believe that? It's pronounced Knipex. I don't believe you. I was, uh, there was a project I was working on where I was going to maybe, like, order, like, 20 of these to do a, like, a project on Etsy with um, some carrying cases for them. And so I was talking to a distributor who was like, yeah, you have to order, like, 20 a month in order to get the distribution uh, prices, which makes sense. And the distributor guy called it a Knipex, and it makes no sense to me. It drives me nuts. Um, we'll keep going. I'm going to write a, a letter. I'm going to write a strongly yeah, worded he's, letter. He's the same kind of guy that thinks it's pronounced GIF, so right. take that for what, for what you will. The, uh, the creator of the GIF pronounces it GIF, and he is dead wrong. Okay. Sorry. There's an opinion there. I always have to disclaim on the classes that I teach about graphic design, I have to disclaim to the students that I have strong opinions about th certain things that don't make a ton of sense, such as how to pronounce that word. Um, I usually get a few chuckles at least. But there's probably that one student who has been pronouncing it GIF who feels bad after class. We'll have to see if I get any strongly worded letters. Just grabbing the right colors of wires to match this here design. Okay. So all it's saying to do is, uh, I guess I don't even need the breadboard, huh? I'm just going to plug this in as such. Um, all right. Orange goes to nine. Have you used any of these on uh, on hobby projects, Zen Hammer? A keypad like this? Yeah. Negative. Have you used it for anything with in your professional career? Mm, no. Our the products we make at most ever have two buttons on them. Nice. The 
This seems like so many inputs, doesn't it? Like just an absurd amount of inputs to try and account for. But I guess if you're making a macro keypad, that makes sense. Yeah. And you have to remember, like, for this number of buttons, eight inputs is a lot more manageable than 17. Yeah. I even mean just like buttons to press, like. Oh, I see what you're this saying. This many different things that your Arduino program does seems just like, man, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, that is true. I guess if you were, I don't know, making like a, a digitally controlled lock or something like that, and you wanted it to be a passcode. Yeah, that's fun. Should we do a passcode thing where we like have to type in a certain code to turn on an LED or something? That sounds great. Just about done wiring this very complicated wiring diagram. It is not complicated. Is it? It's... Isn't it basically just <laughs> hooking up each of the eight inputs to a pin on the Arduino? Yeah, and they're even in order too. Love it. It's not so bad. All right. Cool. All right, that is okay. So when connecting the pins to the Uno R3 board, we connect them to the digital output pins D9 through D2. We connect the first pin to the keypad D9, the second pin to the D8, and so on and such forth. Here's the connection table. Good. Okay, code. After wiring, please open the program in the code folder Lesson 11 Membrane Switch Module and click Upload to upload the program. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, well, let's see here. Where did I save those? Here we go. Okay. Here's our application. Oh, interesting. So it includes keypad.h, keypad library, constant byte rows equals four. I've never seen byte here before. What is what is that all about? Uh byte is maybe just another Hmm. Another data type that's probably equivalent to like a char or just, you know, a single byte of like an unsigned eight sort of data type. Sure. So here we have some arrays, right, for the various buttons. Rows 976, which relay to this is for the pins, connect to the rows of the pinouts and the columns. So it looks like on the on the actual deal here, um, it looks like the rows have this kind of black tab on them, and the columns are this more silvery. So they're separated that way. That's cool. Last new keypad. Okay, here's our serial setup. Oh, it just says get key. If custom key, serial print in custom key. So. So someone has done all the hard work of decoding a keypad and wrapped it all up into a nice keypad.h file. That's awesome. Let's upload this thing. Oh no. No such file a directory keypad.h. Didn't we have this problem last time? We did, yes. What do we do? 
What was the solve? Uh, well, we needed to go into like our library manager or something like that. Oh. You look in like the menu bar somehow. Manage libraries. I think I uploaded one from the. Yeah, I think the inventors kit came with like a zip file that had all the libraries yeah. included in it. It does. Is there any such similar library for this project yeah. kit? Yeah, keypad. So installing a zip file library is. I wonder how I do it. I can't remember. Shoot, don't you hate it when you can't remember stuff? I'm just gonna peek in here and see if there's a... There's keyboard.h. I think we'll have to look at the manual, huh? Let me just open up Microsoft Edge here. Close. I thought that being able to import a zip library was something that you selected from the menu, the drop down menus. Hmm, maybe not. I wonder if it's like up in the file menu. Or something. You just, you hate to look at the manual if you could figure it out, right? Chef Rex, usually I don't remember what I forgot, hence I never forgot to remember because I don't remember what I forgot. That seems dangerous when you're working with steam power, Chef Rex. Make sure to wear your safety glasses. Forgot to relieve the pressure. Let's look at this menu one more time. Maybe if we look at it again, we'll find the answer. I guess we'll just look for keypad too. Oh, you know what? I think we just stuck it in a folder. Pretty sure we just like... Like found the folder of where this thing keeps its libraries and then shoved it in there. That's what, that's what we did, I think. Okay, add libraries and open serial monitor. Okay, lesson one. So sketch include library, okay. Let's see if that's actually where that is. Sketch include library, okay. Yep, add zip library. You got it, Zenhaver. Fantastic. You think we'll rem remember next time? No chance. Hi, there we go. Upload. Can't open device. Oh, it's not plugged in. <laughs> Another requirement that we forgot. Okay, cool. So let's uh, check out our serial monitor. Are you ready? What button should I press? Press six. Yeah, that's cool. Now try pressing nine. Oh, I'm, I'm just spamming all these buttons. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm quite a ways behind still. So, so could a person wire up something? I guess they could. I mean, that's exactly what my keypad PCB does is just wiring up a four by four matrix. Oh yes, absolutely.
I wonder what that would look like on a breadboard. Probably a darn mess, huh? Yeah, probably, but not definitely not something too difficult for a breadboard to handle. Sick. Since you can usually usually uh PCBs are like four layers, I think. You can get them either two layer or four layer. What does that mean? Uh sorry, that's how many layers the traces are allowed to be on. So like a two layer means that the traces can be either on the got... top or on the bottom, but a four layer means that there's top and bottom and then two layers in sort of the middle of the PCB. I think we need to back up. Okay, never mind. Ignore what I said. And let's no, just no. What's a what's a trace? Uh, trace is the the line, basically the wire that goes between different parts of the of the printed circuit board. So like if you, it's kind of like one of one of these, but you just have it built in. I don't know what these means. I'm Are holding up a wire. Yes, it is basically a. It is basically the circuit board equivalent of a jumper wire. Typically, they're referred to as traces. Traces. Um, I want to pick your brain about PCBs, but I think that's a long road, isn't it? Mm, depends on the questions. Um, it seems like there is a whole group of people making custom PCBs. Why haven't you done that? I... <laughs> you mean why haven't I made a custom PCB or why have yeah. not I ordered custom PCBs? Why have you not made any custom PCBs? I actually have made a custom PCB in the past. Oh, I really? dipped my feet into like PCB design. I designed a small circuit board and sent it off to a circuit board foundry and like two weeks later got my custom PCB in the mail. That's awesome. Um, what is what is that process like? I had to, so I did actually did it all through SparkFun. I don't think SparkFun has this functionality anymore, but it used mm -hmm. to have a service where you could upload all of the required PCB files to their servers, and they would like check them to make sure that they were well formed and all that. And then mm -hmm. basically, they would collect a bunch of these custom circuit designs from people and then lay them out into like, you know, I don't know what the size was, but like one foot by one foot is sort of like the quote unquote minimum size that you had to order from these PCB foundries in China. And so they would take all of these smaller designs and then lay them out into Smash a bigger into one. one. Yeah. And then send that to the foundry and get them printed that way. And then would cut them up and send them off to their individual uh, designers. Did you have a minimum order you had to make to, to get that to work? Mm, no. Nice. You able to just do one at a time. Was it fairly cost effective, or was it kind of expensive? I mean, for as far as like, it was very cost effective for me because I was able to get it like a custom PCB for like, you know, ten bucks or something like that. Sure. Yep. But obviously, it there was a large markup because of all of the processing they were doing and right. manual laying out of PCB stuff. That's cool as hell. It was a good service. I'm sure that services like that still exist. I just have been out of that game for probably eight years. What What's the design process look like for that? I used a piece of free software called Eagle, I think. Um, okay. And this was, again, this was a long time ago. But basically, there was libraries of known uh, ICs that you could pick from and like drop into a circuit design ICs? interface yeah i integrated circuits okay so it would like have the pins labeled and all that and that was very much like a free form sort of circuit design interface and it would you just drag and drop lines where they need to go and then you'd basically tell the piece of software to like lay this out for me and then it would sort of automatically generate an actual circuit design an actual printed circuit board design from that cool um, that seems pretty neat. And so you could like tell it to have like an at, is it, 
like whatever the circuit that an Arduino has on it, an yep. Atmega. Yes. Cool. And you basically... could basically design your own little Arduino based on your specific project. Yeah, you could. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. It is. I definitely messed up my first circuit design and like forgot to connect my different grounds together or something stupid like that. And it, yeah. they were very happy to just be like, "Yep, this is a this is a good circuit design. We'll print this for you." <laughs> and then, when I got it, it just didn't work at all. Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> and you, you still need to know what you're doing forever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool, though. I mean, that's that's neat. I mean, the I think what for this design, the creator of it said something like it was like seventy dollars to order a hundred of them, or something like that. Yeah, if you were ordering a big batch of a single type of board, I bet you could have a much easier time getting a foundry to print it for you in large quantities. And he he, uh, he also said, like, the first time he did it, he forgot to label everything, so he forgot to do any of the silk screening. Bodgewire City, in that case. What's a Bodgewire? A, I, if my understanding is correct, it's a jumper wire that you manually solder into a circuit board mm -hmm. in order to fix mistakes you've made. <laughs> sure. Nice. Uh, that was going to be my plan, but I think as I was soldering in jumper wires, I made a stupid decision to do it while the circuit was live or something ridiculous like that, and I let <laughs> the magic smoke out. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, had to get new boards. Gotcha. That's cool though. I mean, I'm I'm so I'm starting to play with these. Uh, I have these uh, prototyping cards. I have just a whole bunch of them. Uh, but I'm planning on for the dog walking treadmill to build it into one of these because that seems really satisfying, as opposed to using a breadboard, uh, which is this. This is basically just a breadboard that you solder stuff into. Um, but uh. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to try to I think the first step to really doing anything with creating any wiring on these is going to find the finding a donor cat5 cable, which I think I should have plenty of laying around here somewhere. Donor cat5 cable to cut apart and use for my wiring um for soldering. But um as I was doing this last week, I did have a question for you. So I did this thing where I wanted to have a double row of uh, these, and they have a name. They are called uh, header sockets. So these header sockets. I wanted to have two of them in here so I could do some prototyping with the Pro Micro, right? So I could set the Pro Micro in here, which I'll pause here so you can catch up. Um, set the Pro Micro in this spot and then be able to use the wires or the uh, sockets on the outside to prototype different things and connect to a breadboard. All right, Chef Rex is off to grab some coffee. Excellent. I too am a 945 coffee drinker on occasion. Um, but I wasn't sure what to do with the backside. And this is really sloppy and I apologize for how sloppy these soldering is, um, but I just use solder to jump it, and I don't know if that was the thing to do. I think that's sort of I think that's actually an intended um thing to do on these really on these free form prototyping boards like you have. I believe that yeah. if you need to jump between two adjacent solder uh holes, you're just supposed to create a solder bridge. I am not very good at them. Me neither. I, I never really got the hang of solder bridging. So I don't have any tips for actually doing <laughs> solder bridges. Sure. Would you probably then in that case use a wire to bridge and then just solder it? Maybe put it a couple a couple holes away and then use a two separate wires? Yeah. Thing? Yeah, maybe. Hmm. I mean, I'm looking at your solder bridges right now, and they look okay to me. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them so, look like they could be getting pretty close to their adjacent solder bridges. I know. How should I test that? Should I just get like a multimeter out? I would and check use a for... multimeter, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that one especially looks like it's probably bridged, but 
Obviously, you don't know which one I'm talking about, but... <laughs> yeah. And it's hard to tell, too, because of the reflection of this. Um, as I look straight down on it, not through, not through this thing, and I don't know if I can even turn off the light on this device. Um, Alternatively, um, you could, instead of creating a solder bridge, basically get a very tiny piece of wire, one that yeah. is only long enough and doesn't have any coating on it or anything, just bare wire, and basically solder it to one and then solder it to the other. So instead sure. of creating one giant glob of solder to bridge, you're basically just soldering a tiny wire in two spots to create the bridge. That sounds better. That's um, what I would probably do. Something I did struggle with as well was... Uh, oh, I love this microscope. It's so cool. I'm so glad I found this at, at Goodwill for so cheap. Is... Uh, getting these parts to stick to the top of this prototype board while I'm soldering them. And so I ended up with like this gap. It's a really slight gap, but as I sit the Arduino in it, it ends up being kind of uneven. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations as to what to do yeah, when you're that's, trying to get these components on here. That was probably my single greatest frustration in using prototype boards like this. Um, I never really had a good solution to that problem. Did you try the blue tacky stuff? Excuse me, blue tacky stuff? No, I haven't tried that. I think you want to just make sure the very first one that you solder is you have it very firmly and snugly up against the board when you solder that first pin, and then every sure. pin after that becomes easier. Gotcha. Does this look like manufacturing defect, or does it look like I just melted that? I think I could have melted that. So hard to tell. I'll leave this up for a moment. So you can I think see I see it. About. I think it's that looks like maybe you melted it. Whoopsie daisy. You have to remember that like these wires are copper, like or at yeah. least partially copper or copper plated or something like that. And copper is an extremely good heat conductor. So oh. leaving and a it... soldering tip on one of these for too long could potentially cause burning like that yeah and that would and that could turn into a short right mm, maybe i would not be super worried about these shorting together internally due to overheating gotcha well cool because even if it melts the plastic i think it's unlikely to melt it significantly enough that like the two wires would sort of melt together or right they'd have no together. reason to to collide or to be brought that yeah. close to each other. Yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to think of what else we want to look at tonight. Um, I think this is good to play with the MOSFETs a little bit. Um, the relay. Let's take a look at the relay project and just see what that looks like. Let's go back up to the start here. These, you know, that's one thing. So I got that SparkFun inventors kit and I think hands down that inventor's kit was was although a lot smaller and three times the price did a much better job at having instructions with their stuff and explaining why we're learning something or how something works. You know, I think at the time I was fairly critical of it cuz it didn't really do the best job, but looking at this Elegoo kit this one really doesn't do a very good job of explaining things. So I think to if I were to do it again, I'm I'm very pleased that I started with that inventor's kit, even though it was more expensive. I think that makes a lot of sense. SparkFun has put a lot of thought into their tutorials, and I think they have a lot of experience creating tutorials like that. So it seems to me like it's a really put together, well put together kit. So this is using a power supply module. So this is using the breadboard power supply, which is not something I've used yet. So it looks like for this particular project, I will want to kind of back up a little bit and see what things will lead into it. Um, as it does have this, uh, this IC, is that what you called it? ICE? 
I I C basically just the acronym for integrated circuit. Yeah, it's I C here. The L two nine three D. Don't know what that does. I don't think it explains it. Looks like um, a motor driver, maybe. No. Oh. Yeah, because like why would it need to be its own module? It's just a L two nine three D. Looks like it explains it here on this motor driver. Uh, it's a half half bridge driver. What does that mean? Oh boy, you remember remember when I said motor driving was a very deep <laughs> hit that I don't have much experience with. <laughs> Yes, I apologize. That is probably wading into that pool. Basically, an H-bridge is a configuration of uh, electronics that is used to drive motors, uh, DC okay. motors. And it's called an H-bridge because the circuit diagram for it looks like a big H. Nice. I love straightforward naming. It's not even named after a dude. I like that. For H. Humphrey. Um, just looking through here. I think I think what I need to do is just scroll through this dang thing and figure out what looks somewhat interesting. Good lord. That, that breadboard power supply thing looks super cool. It we, looks clever as hell. We'll probably work on that sometime soon, huh? I like that a lot. Um... Let's uh, let's just let's at least look at it, right? Don't have a ton more time left tonight, but that's okay. Here's my fancy new breadboard. What's that deal? And then the power supply is down here. All right. So, unplug the steel. So here is this device. It's actually, I could show you really closely on here, but I could also just, you know, show you the picture that they have. Um, so I'm going to hook this up as specified. Oh, cool. It has the positive and negative on there. Ooh. There we go. And they're labeled, which is awesome. Okay. Okay, so component introduction, breadboard power supply. The small DC motor is likely to use more power than an Uno R3 board digital output can handle directly. If we tried to connect the motor straight to an Uno R3 board pin, there's a good chance that it could damage the Uno R3 board. So we use a power supply module provides uh, so we use a, provides power supply. That's it. Uh, the left and right voltage, let's see, we have a locking on off switch. So looks like that's controlled via this jumper here. So our locking on off is controlled via this jumper, I think. No, actually, that's probably just this thing. Yeah, there we go. And a nice little button there. And then there's jumpers for whether we want 5 volt or 3.3 .3 volt on either side. So you could have one rail be 5 volts and the other rail be 3.3 .3 volts? Yeah. Neat. 
I know we talked about that a few weeks ago and about how that would confuse the heck out of me. <laughs> but if you are very deliberate about what you're doing, it does seem like it could be really cool. Right. Chef Rex, that's exactly the style of writing. Power Supply Board 2020 <laughs> provides power supply. Provides power supply. <laughs> Uh, the left and right voltage can be configured independently. To select the output voltage, move the jumper to the corresponding pins. Note, power indicator, LED, and breadboard power rails will not power on if both jumpers are in the off position. Oh, okay. So that's what that was saying. So this is off in the center. It In the diagram, so look, this is what it actually looks like. And this is what the diagram says. So let me zoom in here for you. So the diagram says off in that spot, whereas for us, it says VCC. This is another kind of point on the Elegoo kit versus the SparkFun kit is that this is not the first component where the whatever was in the instructions was a totally different thing than uh, what I had in front of me. So that's where it says off, and here it says VCC instead of off. So am I to trust that that means off? Maybe. I would trust that it means off, putting the jumper in the middle position. Makes sense. It's probably like both negatives or something like that. Yeah. Or like this is like the, think of like this jumper as sort of the, the gate uh, or like the uh, the selector for which side of the circuit it should use. I, I want to avoid using the word gate because that is lo that is loaded terminology from our previous conversation. But yep. if the jumper is in the middle position, it's not connecting either side of the circuit. So nice. So it says to put this. Make sure that you align the module correctly on the breadboard. The negative pin in the module lines up with the blue line on the breadboard, and the positive pin lines up with the red line. Yep good cool so that's all they tell me about it it's it's a pretty straightforward piece of uh circuit like what does the usb do i think the usb is just an alternate means by which you would provide power because you know usb provides power and so if you didn't have a barrel jack connector you could just plug it in to anything that can provide usb and that would power it I wonder if you could run like, so it doesn't even tell me if it sends 12 volts, does it? Okay, so this says, okay, output voltage 3.3 .3 volts or 5 volts. Hmm. Like, what does the USB send? Could that power my Arduino? Maybe. Hmm. Hmm. We'll have to cover so that in the next episode. There's definitely, it definitely is not taking any of like the data. So the USB is like four, four lines, right? Like it's yeah. power ground and two data lines or something like that. It's definitely yep. just like not accessing the two data lines and is purely using that USB plug for power. Um, well, so this is the USB plug here. And it does have all four of them soldered in. That is su not surprising to me because you would want to actually solder all four for structural integrity of the actual plug itself. Sure, OK. But I bet if you looked in the actual circuit board itself, I would wager a guess that those don't lead anywhere. Sure. They're just simply for power. It's not like a serial. Yeah. Serializer. Yes. Is that the right term? Uh, sure. Close enough. <laughs> Voice in the background. I'm going to stop you right there. It doesn't provide power. It provides power supply. 
He is right. It does <laughs> exclusively it provide power. power supply. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I it think was, that's... It was very explicit that it provides <laughs> power supply. Yeah. I don't know. I know you're a professional and all, but... That's funny. Um, yeah, this thing is definitely kind of a mess of... Not written exclusively for English um, in this kit. That's okay. Um, it just takes a little bit of mental decoding as we go through it. So I had no idea that these these eight segment things were this darn complicated. Good Lord. There's a lot that goes on with these. Have you used an eight segment display before? Um, yes, I think I have. Like a, a single eight-segment LCD di mm -hmm. a digit display, you mean? Yeah. My understanding is that it's basically just eight distinct LEDs, and you're controlling each one of them individually. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right, based on what you're seeing? I think so. Oh, I guess the four-digit eight-segment LCD displays oh that's a little bit different goodness gracious i bet that there's some sort of like internal shift register or something i haven't used one of those four four digit ones before this looks like one of those things that i will wire up as a part of any uh, like a tutorial and not understand a single reason as to why it works like well that's what that's what i'll that's what i'll be here for i'll good. i'll help you out Perfect. Um, well, we're at time. Um, Chef Rex says, I think if I were to get four seven segment displays to work, I would spell poop. Same. Same. Yeah, let's Same. do it. Let's do it next time. Uh, we'll get this. Uh, I think that seems like a good thing to practice. I, I like that this only has three um, digital out pins for this to control it, which is cool. It means that you could actually not use your entire Arduino just for this display. <laughs> Quite a bit less than the, um, uh, was it 16 character one? Mm hmm That uses quite a few more wires. Yeah, that, that I see there, the HC595, that is a, yeah. shift, it's a shift register chip, which I think we will go into much more detail next time on what a shift register so. is. Yeah, that sounds good. I like that. That's gives us a plan. Um, well, I'm going to continue. I'm going to try not to do too much on the treadmill project off camera, but um, I probably won't be able to help myself. So uh, we'll kind of review any progress that I make on that project next week. And uh, if you're available and yeah, thank you again so much for joining me tonight. And it's always a pleasure having you on and helping me explain how some of this magic wizardry stuff works. Um, thanks, uh, thanks Chef Rex and everyone else who's uh, been in chat and who's been not in chat, just enjoying the stream. Um, any any parting thoughts or remarks, Zen Hever? Thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure talking to you about this stuff. Excellent. Well, uh, I will be talking to you soon and. Hope everyone has a nice night.